guys, I'm Emily. Welcome everyone! On this video, I'm going to a few locations in San Diego. I didn't have a whole lot of time on this day, and I wanted to do something other than the zoo, which we'd done a few years ago. Actually, now that I think about it, we went to the zoo about 15 years ago, so I don't really remember a lot of it. But I will go to some other places in San Diego and give some thoughts. And at the time of this filming, I'll talk about a possible future visit to San Diego. Oh, and I forgot in the last video near the Embracing Peace statue, I saw a cute chihuahua. And I forgot to do something every time I see a chihuahua in the wild. Hey. Is that... Smidge? After having breakfast, my first stop was the San Diego Comic Con Museum. There were some exhibits here that seemed interesting to me, such as the Popnology exhibit, where yesterday's fantasy is today's reality. Some of the Space Age themed items in this display include Space Checkers, the Space Belt, an astronaut's space helmet, and a Space Age erector set. Look at this, a photo of Buzz Aldrin in his NASA spacesuit, and he signed it, We Come in Peace for All Mankind, 1969 AD. According to this, Dr. Mae Jemsen, the first black female astronaut, was inspired by Star Trek's Neota Uhura. When the original series aired, there were no women or non-white astronauts. Over here, I'll attempt to steer this vehicle to the, on the surface of Mars. This is in the 1890s, American astronomer Percival Lowell built a private observatory in Flagstaff to study the theory that there was once life on Mars. From Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, Star Trek says that it has not all but happened, not all been discovered, that tomorrow can be as challenging and as adventurous as any time man has ever lived. The display next to that quote has numerous ways we have played games, watched films, and printed books. Look here, do you see Jory LaForge's visor? Also famous books such as Gulliver's Travels, Jurassic Park, as well as a shred of DNA and an old Nintendo Game Boy. Books on Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, the Disney World monorail with a picture of Walt Disney and Mickey Mouse, and copies of the magazine Popular Science. Good morning, Dave. The famous Computer Hell 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey. The movie came out in 1968, 42 years before Siri was introduced. The movie was produced and directed by Stanley Kubrick and inspired by short stories by Arthur C. Clarke. The Hell 9000 became paranoid and tried to kill the crew. This is one of the possible scenarios being discussed as AI matures. But many scientists, including Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking, have expressed concerns about the unfettered evolution of AI. This is interesting. Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, Ray Bradbury, and Isaac Asimov predicted so much. Look at this list. Solar spacecraft, lunar rockets, newscasts, generic engineering, Atomic bombs, automatic doors, earbuds, social media, automatic coffee makers, large flat screen TVs, and unmanned space missions. This is interesting. The mobile device we all carry around used to take up space in an entire room. A TV, a clock, a telephone, a Rolodex, 
A calculator, a mail order catalog, a radio, a typewriter, a calendar, a watch, credit cards, and countless games. But wait, there's more. A dictionary, video player, record player, an encyclopedia, an alarm clock, and stereo equipment, and vinyl records and cassettes, all replaced by a mobile device. This just has much music, pictures, video, and more can fit in your mobile device, compared to stacks of CDs or cassettes. Here's the DeLorean time machine from the Back to the Future franchise. This marker in front of me says that the Mr. Fusion was actually a modified coffee grinder. This marker says the time machine was a DeLorean because the director, Robert Zemeckis, wanted a sports car with glowing doors. His first choice was the classic 1950s Mercedes, but the DeLorean was much cheaper, so they went with that. And my calculations are correct, when this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious So back to the future part 2, collectibles. The film predicted smartphones, Zoom meetings, VR, headsets, and for baseball they predicted the Miami team and the Cubs winning the World Series, except they won in 2016, one year too late. But what just barely made it in 2015 were the self-lacing shoes. You can get a pair for about $450 on Amazon. So no hoverboards yet in real life, but in the movies it was invented by John Bell, a concept designer working at Industrial Light and Magic. On the left is the letter Marty wrote to warn Doc that he'd be killed by the Libyans. Now on the right is the USA Today paper as soon as the second film. Up here is a prop for the plutonium used to power the time machine, and down here is Grace Sports Almanac, taken by Biff, and you know what happened after that. Remember when Doc and Marty took their picture in front of the clock tower in the third film? There's a photo using the film. Smile, Doc. In the first film, there's a photo where everyone slowly disappeared until George kissed Lorraine, and then everyone reappeared. This, I think, is a recreation of the alien from the Alien movie franchise starring Sigourney Weaver. This display over here describes a new car that's being developed called the Strati. Instead of 2,000 parts, the Strati has just 40 parts. Each part is created using a 3D printer. It also takes just two days to assemble and weighs 2,200 pounds. The design to production time was only four months. So everything on this car was 3D printed, even the wheels, windshield, and engine. Its maximum speed is 50 miles per hour, and they predict it could cost just $5,000 when mass produced. Here's some 3D printers. But I don't think these are the ones that created the Strati car because some of those car parts are really large. Also, do these printers make sturdy parts in case the car has a crash? This appears to be one of the original Disneyland Autopia ride vehicles. The marker on the left says the legendary Imagineer Bob Burr designed most of the early ride vehicles. I'm sorry to notice the theme is museum. Elon Musk appears to be considered a thoughtful, transcendental scientist. Uh, no. He's a hack. I'm not sure what this robot is doing. I think it's trying to pick up this potato, but it's having about as much luck as those claw games you see in a hotel or Walmart. Take a look at this R2-D2 made with a bunch of these small wooden planks. 
That looks really neat. Or should I say, it looks impressive. Most impressive. This talked about the 1918 flu pandemic. As said at the time, though the only way to protect yourself was social isolation, disinfectants, and good hygiene. It also knows the COVID genome was mapped in a matter of days. Here are a few popular movies that featured an outer space theme, such as E.T., The Martian, Contact, and Interstellar. It was also known as E.T.'s communication device was his glowing finger. Going through the centuries from mechanization to digitization, down here, a quote from Arthur C. Clarke says a universal replicator would be invented by the year 2040. This display shows a workshop where it looks like a suit is being developed that can make a human being fly like an airplane. Kinda reminds you of Iron Man a little bit, doesn't it? And here's some robot type characters. Some I recognize from the movies, and others that might have been sold at Radio Shack. I definitely recognize R2D2 on the left. I think the robots on the show came from Radio Shack. There's a quick close up of R2D2. And if I pan to the right, you see the original Terminator from the 1984 film. Fail. Here's another cabinet with a laser disc of the movie E.T., a picture of Gene Roundberry, some real videotape, an old cell phone, and the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Also in this museum is an exhibition featuring superheroes that were constructed out of cardboard. This should be pretty cool to look at. Wow, look at this. This is a cardboard representation of the Hulkbuster armor from Avengers Age of Ultron. This is really impressive. I bet it took a lot of time to construct this. As I walk from right to left, they have Wally and then Wonder Woman's outfit and lasso. Then a weird standing position is another, none other than Iron Man. Next up is Black Manta, the villain from Aquaman. And then as I pan over to the left, there's a cardboard version of Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy. They had to have taken a lot of work to construct him with that detail. On this desk are Thor's hammers, Mjolnir, and Stormbreaker. In this cabinet are characters from the Pac-Man video game. Then down here is the baby Groot and other small superhero items such as logos and vehicles. In this area of the museum are various kinds of anime. It looks like it's from something called Cowboy Bebop. I'm not very familiar with anime, so I'm relying on post research. Cowboy Bebop is a Japanese neo-noir space western anime TV series. It was created by animation staff that have named themselves Hajime Yatate. Look at this old computer. It has to be at least 25 years old. It comes with a 5 and 1 fourth and 3 and 1 half floppy disk drives, a DVD burner. This may also have an old timey modem installed. Looking at the inside of the PC. Here are some examples of computer generated comics based on the Marvel comic universe. These were created in the mid 1990s. And here's a small pit limited edition statue made in 1994. I'm not sure who this character is supposed to be. Alright, here's what I came here to see. This exhibit called Excelsior, The Life and Legacy of Stan Lee. There should be classic comic books and other Marvel stuff. This year, the Comic Con Museum celebrates the 100th birthday of Stan Lee, showcasing his amazing 78 year career. There are some comic books from the museum curator's private collection. 
Back in this glass display, there's a Marvel Universe book. On uh, the top right, a November 1969 copy of the Fantastic Four Annual. And on the bottom left is Marvel Tales Annual from September 1964. There are select pages from classic comic books, like this one, a Fantastic Four comic from 1962, then The Amazing Spider-Man from 1965, then Tales of Suspense from February 1964, a cover of The Amazing Spider-Man, and a black and white cover of The Spectacular Spider-Man from July 1968. Some other black and white covers of Marvel Comics from the 1960s, there's Captain Marvel, The Submariner, and Captain America. Actually, the Captain America annual issue is from January 1971. This is a nice display with a brief chronicle of Stanley's life from a young boy in the 1920s through his later years. And one picture shows Stanley using a standing desk to use his typewriter, which he said saved his back. This also features Stanley's first boss of Marvel, Joe Simon. Look at these old Marvel comics starting in the 1950s was, were created by artist Jack Kirby. He was considered innovative at the time with a style of narr narrative art that captured energy and motion. This was meant to push the comic book reader from page to page instead of focusing on a particular frame. Kirby stated he was in competition with TV and motion pictures. And this display is a comic book slash romance novel script from 1953 called My Sister Tommy The Meeting of Love. The script was edited by Stan Lee, which is interesting because it's a romance novel. Here are some 60 year old comic books in what looks like to be in mint condition. They are encased in plastic and given a grade. There's a lot of great stuff, but I wish the exhibit were much bigger. I think Stan Lee's body of work over almost 80 years deserves more space, especially in a comic themed museum. The final exhibit in this museum is called The Art of the Comic-Con Masquerade. This is a celebration of the costuming and cosplay. Here are some of the mascots on this table. These are Freaky Tiki Freddy and the Phantom of the Opera. Here are some other awesome looking masks, also from Fun Days, and one from Heavy Metal Halloween. Also on this table, a Paul Bunyan, Smokey the Bear, a masked Tom Sawyer, and another bear. Then an eagle, maybe a fox, a little boy, and a lion. Starting with the cosplay of Gossamer from Looney Tunes. Now looking at the full length costumes. Some of these costumes certainly look, uh, interesting. Look at these costumes. I see Batwoman, Superman, Captain America, and more. There are a few other costumes, such as characters in Alice in Wonderland. Here are some comic books I missed earlier, but these have a lower score, maybe because they are well used. This is from a comic book featuring Doctor Strange, Master of Black Magic. This is from a Japanese manga series called My Hero Academia. This is about a civilization where superpowers have become common. But there's a boy that doesn't possess any superpowers, yet still dreams about becoming a superhero. The world's great hero bestows his powers on the boy. As I leave the museum, I'll be exiting through the gift shop. Let's see what they have in here. These Disney paintings are on sale for $150 a piece. They are called Disney Treasures on Canvas. Here are some paintings by the Thomas Kincaid Studios. Each of these paintings are $89. All these paintings are superhero themed. Check out this painting of Walt's drive-in with many Disney characters. 
All of these are Disney themed as well. Oh, there's Alice in Wonderland. I thought the Comic Con Museum was great. My favorite part was the Stanley exhibit. I did think this museum was a little biased in, toward making Elon Musk and Bill Gates legendary scientists, which I think is a bit much. Let's shift gears completely and visit Cabrillo National Monument. This historic national monument is at the end of a small peninsula that borders the Pacific Ocean. It's a little foggy so the view is obscured, but it's still a beautiful view of Coronado. The Naval Air Station and the Pacific Ocean. Look at the plane leaving San Diego International Airport, which is not far from here. I wish it wasn't so foggy though. It doesn't seem foggy, but the San Diego skyline is definitely obscured. Hopefully while I'm here, some of the fog will lift. It's so very beautiful today. Temperatures are in the mid-60s. People are on their boats having a great day. The Naval Air Station is directly in front. Look at the statue I'm walking towards. The statue is a representation of the person for whom this national monument is named. This is Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. He led the first European exploration of what is now the U.S. West Coast. In September 1542, Cabrillo discovered this body of water, today known as the San Diego Bay, and he anchored his ship very near to where I'm standing. Cabrillo was a prominent leader and businessman in Guatemala. When the governor tapped him to lead the expedition north along the Pacific coast beyond Mexico to enhance our trade with Indonesia. Down here is a marker, the part I can read it says Jose Rodriguez Cabrillo 1524 and to the Portuguese navigator Jose Rodriguez Cabrillo a tribute from the Portuguese navy. And it looks like this marker was placed here in April 1957. A short trail leads to the Point Lomo Lighthouse. This is San Diego's first lighthouse, built in 1855. At one time, it was the highest coastal lighthouse in the country, at 400 feet above sea level, but it was very difficult to see it in the fog because the light would shine above the fog line. Just a few steps from here are a series of buildings in addition to the lighthouse. There are assistant keepers, quarters, and a barn. This whole area is on the National Register of Historic Places. You can see the Cabrillo sculpture in, way in the distance, and beyond that is the Navy base, and be behind that is the San Diego skyline. The lighthouse itself is not that tall, but the hill I'm on is just about 350 or more feet above sea level. Here's the original bulb they used. I think all those bridges enhance the brightness of the light. This display discusses the life and duties of lighthouse keepers. They have to make sure the lighthouse is in working order, keep the buildings clean, and the chimneys swept to prevent fire. Here's another look at the bulb. Those aren't ridges, they are numerous small pieces that look like mirrors. So that's how the light gets so bright. This is the first lighthouse in what is now San Diego. The light was so bright and the lighthouse so high in elevation, boaters could see the light 39 miles away when there is no fog. Here are some other lighthouses built during the mid-1850s along the west coast including Alcatraz, Four Point, Point Conception, Old Point Loma, Point Pinos, Farallon Island, and Cape Disappointment. Here are some of the tools keepers use to maintain the lighthouse in the grounds. This notes the unofficial keepers creed was use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. Here's my first look at the Pacific Ocean side of Cabrillo National Monument. Down here is a road you can take to reach the coastline. You can see how rough the surf is. Here's a rear view of the lighthouse building. 
We'll head down to the coast in a few minutes, but first, let's check out the inside of the lighthouse and check out some of the rooms. This room has a wood fire oven. I think this is dining room. Here's a dining table with plates, silverware, cups, and glasses. Now take a look at the living room. Here's a rocking chair by the window. There's also a fireplace, some pictures on the mantel, and a writing area to the left, and a couple of tables to the right of the fireplace. Here's a table where some someone can brush their hair or apply makeup. Here's one of the bedrooms. You see the bed, help chest, and a fireplace. And here are the items you need to clean yourself. No plumbing in the 1850s. Looking up at the bulb, there's a glass panel from where I'm standing in the bulb, so I can't go up any further. Here's another bedroom with a guitar resting on the bed. Very basic. The bedroom does have a desk with some books and a lantern. One more look at the view from the bay side, with the navy base and the downtown skyline. Now let's take a drive down to the Pacific Coast. There's a platform where I was looking at the Pacific Ocean. Now I'm down here, and I'm taking the short path to the cliffs at the edge of the Pacific Ocean. There's a path that goes all the way down to the water, but that's more dangerous, so I'll be staying at the edge of the cliff. A reminder not to take any shells or rocks that's against the law in someone's home. And here's the amazing shoreline. This marker shows what the shoreline looks like at high tide and low tide. Based on this, we're about halfway between high and low tides. Maybe we're closing in on high tide. I've never been here, so it's hard for me to judge. Well, the water isn't that far from the coast side. On the way out, I'm driving by Fort Rosecrans National Cemetery. This is a military cemetery named after Union General William Stark Rosecrans. There are over 120,000 people interred in the cemetery. Now headed back to the city, and the skyline is still fogged over but definitely visible in the distance. I need to get just enough gas to get me to Disneyland tomorrow and then on to LAX on January 1st. This place is actually a bargain compared to most other gas stations around here. Certainly better than that one yesterday in Okotio. Current price, $4.59 a gallon. Let's read at the last 90 seconds of the sunset. I think this is as good as it's gonna get, unfortunately.
I found a parking area just off the ocean to see the sunset. Clouds are starting to build in though, so I won't be getting the perfect sunset as the sun goes down below the ocean. Thankfully we can at least see the sun this evening. I checked the weather forecast, there's a chance of rain this evening and a better chance of rain tomorrow morning. Which kind of stinks because we're going to Disneyland tomorrow morning and it seems like Californians aren't used to driving in the rain. But that's okay. I had a good day in San Diego, but I wish I had a couple more days to really explore this beautiful city. And that's it. The weather deteriorated as the evening went on. We left the next morning to go to Disneyland for the next couple of days. I'm thinking of going back to San Diego later in 2024. There's just so much here. I didn't do enough exploring at Old Town. I also didn't go to the Gaslamp Quarter or Little Italy. I'd also like to go back to the San Diego Zoo. I also wouldn't stay where we stayed. There wasn't enough parking and just before we got there, they started charging for breakfast. $12 for pastries? Nah, I'll just go to Denny's and get a real breakfast. Which is... what we did. Anyway, now that I got my December 2023 road trip videos out, I'll start pushing videos from other great places that I've been. We can see that next time. Thanks for watching! Bye! Ha, ha, ha.